Hello, it's Craig here today with a dagger build after answering a topic that dagger enthusiasts are dying to know the answer to. Two-handing or dual-wielding daggers. Just which is better? Intuitively, you would think that two-handing daggers isn't great, but it actually has a decent moveset. The power stance moveset of daggers got buffed to be quicker, while the status effect application of power stancing got nerfed in general. After these changes, this question is more ambiguous than ever. Allow me to solve this problem for you today, as I take on this request for a light load PvE dagger focused build to really accentuate the dagger's speed. One condition for this request is that we will not be using another weapon class unless it is a catalyst, aka staffs and seals, whose purpose is to buff the daggers. Therefore, our main focus right now is to solve whether two-handing daggers or power stancing them is better, as this will be a large focus of how an optimized build will look like. Let's begin by taking a look at the motion values or damage percent of the two-handed light attack chain and the power stance attacks, as these are going to be your main spammable attack options. Thankfully, daggers all have the same two-handed light attack chain, making the motion values and frame data fairly consistent. There are 6 hits in 6 attacks for the dagger's two-handed light attack chain. Next comes the frame data, which will be a lot more difficult to understand if you don't know what you're seeing. With the frame data explorer, you can hover over each item, which will tell you what is going on. For example, the attack animation of a two-handed dagger's first light attack chain happens from frame 11 to 14 which means that it has a 10 frame startup. All these frame data are in 30 FPS by the way, because that's how the game is coded. For those that are used to 60 FPS, multiply all these numbers by 2. Now, you do see a ton of the blue blocks. The relevant one for us right here is the light attack block, which shows you when you can follow up the attack chain into light attack number 2. If you are spamming your light attack button, you will queue your next light attack, which will come out as soon as possible on the 14th frame. If we line them up in time by clicking the top of this attack and adjusting the frames, it will look something like this. This is an excellent tool to help you visualize the attacks better. The other more relevant information for this discussion would be the dodge frame. This is when you can dodge after an attack. This is important because oftentimes you have to dodge a boss's attack or reposition. The available frame to dodge is always earlier than waiting for the animation to end and then walking. For this calculation, I will always assume your chain ends with a dodge. So now that we know the very basics, we are going to take a look at the full 6 hit chain. I am going to count out all the frames needed for the full 2 handed dagger light attack chain. For example, we already know the first light attack is chainable on the 14th frame. The first attack therefore takes up 13 frames. Likewise, the second attack takes up 16 frames. Here, I'm lining all of the attacks up and then checking for the final 6th attack. For the 6th attack, we're going to cancel the rest of the animation with a dodge frame which can happen on the 28th frame of the 6th attack. Overall, it corresponds to the 94th frame of the entire chain. These are the individual numbers if you want to check them out. Before we do some analysis, let us take a look at the Power Stance Dagger moveset 2 so that we can compare them. The Wakizashi will be excluded from this discussion, as that particular dagger power stances with the katanas. Once again, the Power Stance moveset minus the Wakizashi are all the same, so the MVs are also the same. We're also going to find the frame data the same way we did it for the two handed daggers. The only difference is there are only 4 moves that total up to 10 attacks in this chain, while each move takes longer. Finding the frames, we get 24, 15, 18, and then 32 by using the dodge for the final attack. Now, to double check, by shifting all the attacks, we do indeed get the same result where the chain lasts for 89 frames and you can dodge on the 90th frame. Now to summarize some basic information. The two-handed dagger move set has a total of 640 MV over 6 hits in 6 attacks, which is 106.7 MV on average per hit. 
whereas the Power Stance Dagger has a total of 10 hits in 4 attacks, which is 88.8 MV on average per hit. This does indeed mean that Power Stance attacks suffer more from defense, which I will talk about later. However, the total MV is also much higher, so it will most certainly do more damage. And since the frame data is relatively similar, we can also expect higher DPS from the Power Stance moveset. Let us add 15 frames for dodging and repositioning after the chain. If we then divide the MV by the number of frames, we get 5.87 MV per frame for the two-handed daggers, and 8.46 MV per frame for the Power Stance daggers. Using these numbers, the Power Stance moveset is a whole 44% higher in terms of DPS. However, there are other factors that lower this, so this isn't entirely accurate. In reality, Power Stance will still do more damage, but definitely not 44% more. Now, you might argue that using the full chain isn't a great indicator of DPS, so let us use half of both attack chains this time, which will be 3 attacks on the two-handed dagger and 2 attacks on the Power Stance ones. These are the frames needed for half the chain. If we repeat the MV divided by frames by adding another 15 frames for the dodge, these are the results. We get 5.29 MV per frame for the two-handed daggers, and 7.27 per frame for the Power Stance ones. This would mean that the Power Stance moveset deals 38% more DPS than the two-handed one. Once again, this is not entirely accurate because of other factors, but it does show that if you don't complete your chain, the DPS slightly skews towards a two-handed dagger's favor. Comparing their DPS to the full chain, the two-handed dagger moveset loses 10% DPS, while the power stance moveset loses 14% DPS under our assumptions. Now, the regular MV doesn't tell the whole story. What if we wanted a bleed build? While the frame data for the attacks are the same, the status MVs are different. It was especially nerfed for power stance attacks. In fact, if we divide the total status MVs like we did for the damage MVs, we get 5.5 and 5.33 respectively. Power stance daggers actually do 3% less status damage versus two-handed daggers over the same duration. But let's be real. With only a 3% difference in status damage, but a lot more raw damage, power stancing is definitely still in the lead. Even if I were running a status build, I'd still prefer power stancing over two-handing. Weapon buffs also work separately in terms of MV. When I'm talking about weapon buffs, I'm talking about things that apply a buff to your weapon, like greases or spells such as lightning armament and scholar's armament. Compared with the normal damage MVs, you can see that the power stance buff MV are nearly equivalent. The numbers are shifted here and there, but they total out to about the same. On the other hand, the two-handed buff MVs are always 100, so they're always less than the damage MVs of two-handed daggers. Therefore, if we're only looking at the MVs, the two-handed buffs are slightly less efficient. But the two-handed buff MVs actually produces more damage from the buffs than the power stance ones. This is obvious if you think about it for a moment. Even though the two-handed buff MVs are lower in comparison to the damage MVs, by power stancing, you can only apply the buff to your main hand weapon, even though you attack with both weapons. Therefore, in reality, the buffs are only half as effective for power stancing because you would only receive the benefits from half of these attacks. So, weapon buffs favor two-handing. However, the more powerful weapon buffs tend to require heavy investment into faith or intelligence, while not being able to infuse your weapon with magic or flame and sacred infusions. Therefore, the stat investment is much heavier for it to be effective. Even if you do run these buffs, the buff's AR won't measure up to a dagger's base AR by just investing into the infusion's scaling stat. It is definitely more of a potential style at higher levels, with backloaded catalysts in play. But, as you will later see, if this is 150 or under, this playstyle is definitely not optimal. Still, let us look at some other factors that favor two-handing. First and foremost, 
the most obvious one, weight. If our level isn't high enough to effectively play with buffs yet, we still have to consider the weight of the daggers, however light they are, because we want light rolls. Even on daggers, it does take a few extra points of investment when you're trying to stay under 30% equip load. We will ignore the Sindakuya and the Wakizashi, as they are not really power stance candidates. If we use one of the heavier daggers and still want to light roll, that's 8.33 more weight. Even the lightest ones will require 5 more weight. But overall, I wouldn't say this would really sway me towards two-handing, even though we want light rolls for the agile build. After all, daggers are one of the lightest weapon class. It is a tiny difference though, and tiny differences can add up. Next is the responsiveness of the movesets. What I mean by responsiveness is how easy it is for you to suddenly want to dodge or do another action. You can see here that the two-handed moveset is divided up into smaller frame data. To add on to that, the dodge frame available is closer to each individual attack on the two-handed moveset versus the power stanced moveset. Therefore, the two-handed moveset will feel smoother to play and you can more readily respond to unexpected situations. However, once again, this is but a small difference. Daggers are already fast. Even the slower moveset of the power stance dagger is still generally faster than many other heavier weapon classes. While this difference does indeed slightly favor the two-handed moveset, I personally think the power stance moveset is still responsive enough for it to not feel clunky. It is a trade-off I am ready to take for much more damage. Finally, defense. This is not a very obvious point for many people, but unlike responsiveness, this is an easily quantifiable factor. I've already previously established that while the power stance moveset has more total MV, it actually has less MV per hit on average. Over an entire chain, the two-handed moveset only needs to go through defense 6 times, but the power stance moveset has to go through defense 10 times. How does this affect our damage? All PvE enemies have at least 100 of any type of defense. I am going to use 106 defense, which I think should be a relatively nice representation. You can increase this or decrease this by a bit, but the overall numbers won't change much. Oh, and ignore the damage types for the calculator. The top one is going to be two-handed, while the bottom one will be power stanced. We can input the average MV to save some time. This will be slightly off from inputting each individual MV, but this is easier to explain. Multiplying the final damage dealt by the number of hits we do for each moveset, we get 2040 and 2690 for the final damage of each chain. As you can see from the total damage negation column, the smaller MV receives a larger percent negation. Remember how we said the power stance moveset deals 44% more damage than the two-handed one? Well, after defense calculation, we see that it actually only deals 32% more damage. This is a far more accurate estimate. Factoring in the other small stuff I talked about and how we don't always complete attack chains, all of these factors swing the argument towards two-handing. Yet, as I pointed out, the other factors are quite small for two-handing. So, we are still going to pick to power stance daggers for our build especially because there is one advantage power stance daggers have. That is the ability to hold two ashes instead of one, which can grant you the much needed range for some engagements without giving up an ash on your main dagger. Let us take a look at the build I arrived at for level 125. We're going for a dexterity based build because Thunderbolt is a great offhand ash of war to cover long distance targets. We're also running 25 faith. You can technically forego this and just invest into dexterity, but Golden Vow is such a powerful incantation. Having 25 faith also grants you access to some of the utility incantations like Best Chill Vitality for some additional HP regeneration. Your armor is relatively light, and the additional negation from Golden Vow can make all the difference without losing out on damage. You're also in light rolls, which enables you to make distance to recast the buff if needed in boss battles. As for the main Ash of War, I chose Blood Tax. 
I did a comparison of blood tax and repeating thrusts in my previous video already. Feel free to take a look. There are two reasons why I chose this ash. First, the HP regeneration from landing your hits. This is very valuable and enables you to keep up your pressure. With 50 Vigor, you're healing about 15% of your maximum HP if you land all the hits. With higher Vigor, you will heal more raw value, although it'll heal a bit less total percent of your max HP. It is also a multi-hit move that keeps up your flurry of attacks from your power stance moveset to enable your two damage multiplying talismans, the Millicent's Prosthesis and the Rotten Wing Sword Talisman. By having Blood Tax take care of your sustain, you are able to forego the Godskin Swaddling Cloth. This talisman also takes 7 hits with daggers to activate, so it actually doesn't work as well as it does with Power Stand Straight Swords. Blood Tax provides this build more sustain than the Godskin can. Furthermore, because the dagger's AR is low, you typically want your weapon art to be a bullet art where base AR doesn't matter, or something like the blood tax where you are receiving additional utility. Repeating thrust does indeed do more damage, but on a dagger's low AR, the damage difference hardly matters. Instead, we trade our damage for the utility of being able to heal and keep up our pressure with our damage increasing talismans without needing to run and flask. This build also scales into higher levels just fine as you have quite a bit more room for improvement. Figure is a no-brainer until 60. You can invest into more endurance and ditch the great jars for another talisman you want to run. Many things can work in the slot, depending on your playstyle. Dexterity investment grants you more raw damage and a stronger thunderbolt. Now, let me talk about the two dagger options for this build. For more details, you can watch my dagger breakdown. But these are the dexterity based daggers that have high AR. You can pick either Power Stancing Great Knives or Celebrant's Sickle. The first question I know people are bound to ask is, why aren't you running the Misery Cord? To which my answer is, feel free to run it if you're thinking about replacing one Celebrant's Sickle. You're only losing a bit of AR and the shield penetration for the increased critical damage and length of the Misery Cord. The thing is, you don't really stance break, so the main source of critical damage you're going to be doing is from backstabs. If you like to mix in some sneaky or stealthy gameplay, feel free to do it. As for the two main weapons I recommend, both have their own advantage in addition to both being the lightest daggers at 1.5 weight. First up, the Celebrant Sickle has the highest AR, although not by much. Secondly, it is a sickle type weapon which means it has 50% base shield penetration. This makes fighting shield enemies much easier, as daggers can struggle a ton against these enemies. Finally, it is longer than the Great Knife, which does make a difference, especially on larger targets with wonky hitboxes. Celebrant Sickle is the kind of weapon that equalizes most encounters. It makes it so that you don't suddenly run across an encounter that just counters you because of your setup. At least, as much as it possibly can. On the other hand, the Great Knife has base bleed, which is why you should either power stance this or not at all. Your main purpose is to proc bleed with this weapon. And you can also invest into some arcane and run the Blood Flame Blade if you choose to. Since we're running a keen infusion, you can still apply the buff. Blood Flame Blade's bleed buildup is a flat 40 over 2 seconds and is not affected by arcane. The damage bonus isn't going to be high anyway, cause we're only running 25 faith. So the other buff options like Electrify Armament or Scholar's Armament, if we had to choose Intelligence instead of Faith, wouldn't be great. Great Knife will indeed enable more damage on targets that do bleed, but Celebrant Sicko is the more comfortable pick. Now, I want to talk a bit more about the buffs, specifically the Scholar's Armament. If you have like another 100 or so levels to spare, this buff can be quite potent if you want to try two-handed daggers. At max intelligence versus max faith, we can see that the Lusat has much higher pure intelligence scaling versus the Erdtree's faith scaling. Keep in mind that these buffs only scale to either intelligence or faith, so stuff like the Prince of Death staff doesn't work well. We see that Scholar's Armament will offer 17.2% more AR than Lightning Armament 
thanks to Lusat's scaling. The additional FP cost hardly matters in this case. Why do I say that this is for much higher levels? Because at lower levels like 50 intelligence or 50 faith or even 60, the effect is not nearly as pronounced. The Academy's Glintstone staff only has 4.23% more intelligence buff than the God Slayer's faith buff. If we include the ability to cast Golden Vow, the winner is clear. Faith just wins out. Therefore, without 80 intelligence, I wouldn't run the Scholar's Armament. Okay, now, I know the video already contains a dense load of information, but stick with me here. I'm going to show you the investment paths for 50 dexterity plus 25 faith, to prove to you that going for 75 dexterity and 25 faith beats going for 50 dexterity and 50 faith. These are the stats we get for 75 dexterity and 25 faith. Using the Celebrant Sickle and Lightning Armament, we get a total of 548 AR. Next is 50 dexterity and 50 faith. We swap to the Godslayer seal and is able to achieve 558 AR, which is 10 more total AR versus 75 dexterity and 25 faith. However, this is only for the main hand, and if we consider the offhand without buffs, the dexterity version obviously wins. Furthermore, dexterity also scales Thunderbolt, as it is a dexterity based bullet art. Oh, and for those wondering about the Earth Steel Dagger, especially for the 50 Faith distribution, I am afraid it isn't a great stagger, even with 50 Dexterity and 50 Faith. It's shorter than the Celebrant Sickle and has less AR. It also doesn't have the Shield Penetration. We can choose the Flame or Sacred Infusion for the Earth Steel, but it nerfs Thunderbolt's damage on the offhand, as Bullet Arts scale to affinities as well. It also doesn't work with Blood Tax on the main hand. Additionally, we also lose the option to buff the weapon. Due to the low AR of daggers, we will also suffer more from split damage type. Therefore, the Earth Steel Dagger isn't good for our build. Now that I've explained the Power Stance build, this is a bonus build for those who do go higher leveled for PvE. This is a two-handed dagger build that takes full advantage of Lusat's high sorcery scaling to buff up your dagger. Granted, this is a backloaded staff, so I don't suggest playing this anywhere under level 200. Feel free to change the blood tax for something like Thunderbolt if you don't want to just use your staff to cover your ranged option, but personally, I would just bring a ranged spell or two. If you're still watching this video and really like my content, buying my book in the YouTube description down below will allow you to request a detailed topic for me to fully optimize, just like this one. Or you can buy it to just support the channel so I can keep making videos. Like and subscribe. Krite, signing out.